during uh, the past week and for this Sunday and for the Sunday next to come, we're going to be focusing on the book of Esther. Now, the book of Esther is an important book within the Jewish community because it is read in its complete version every year around the Feast of Purim. Um, so it's a story that is well known. It leads to uh, certain parties and activities in the synagogues around the celebration. And so it's right for us also to look at the book. The book itself really is, can be considered a folk tale. It has historical components, but it's written in a form that also includes farce and exaggeration to teach a moral lesson. It happens during a time when there were still Jewish exiles living under the kingdom of Persia, and it speaks of one of the Persian kings, Ahasuerus. Now, in today's passage, we're going to hear from Esther chapter 2. We're going to be introduced to some new characters. First, we'll hear about a man named Mordecai. Mordecai is of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Jew living in exile. And it's important to note that because he's of the tribe of Benjamin, that relates him back to the stories of King Saul. And the only reason that's important, but the Jewish community would know this, is because his enemy in the story, a man named Haman, is listed as someone from the tribes of Agag. And if you go back to the stories in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, you know that the people of Agag were some of the mortal enemies of King Saul. So there are layers in this story, even in just the genealogy. The other person that we meet is the young girl, Esther. Now, Esther is given two names, and that was also not an uncommon feature, particularly in Persian culture. In the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel also had a Jewish name and a Persian name. So Esther is first introduced to us as a Jewish girl named Hadassah. And Hadassah means myrtle, the spiced plant. But her Persian name is Esther, which either comes from the Persian god Ishtar or means simply the word star. And the chapter ends with another banquet. We had a banquet in chapter 1 of Esther, which ended with Queen Vashti losing her place of prominence. This one, the chapter ends with a banquet in which Esther receives the crown and is named as the new queen of the region. But the first chapter ended with a type of punishment, and the second chapter is going to end with some people plotting an assassination against the king being hung outside the city walls. So the threats in the story are slowly building up and they'll reach their climax in the next chapters. So here's selected verses from Esther chapter 2. Now, there was a Jew in the citadel of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shammai, son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with King Jeconiah of Judah, whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had carried away. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his cousin, for she had neither father nor mother, and the girl was fair and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in the citadel of Susa, under the custody of Hegai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Hegai, who had charge of the women. The girl, Esther, pleased him and won Hegai's favor, and he quickly provided her with cosmetic treatments and her portion of food and with seven chosen maids from the king's palace, and advanced her and her maids to the best place in the harem. Esther did not reveal her people or kindred, for Mordecai had charged her not to tell. When Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. Of all the virgins, she won his favor and devotion so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And then the king gave a great banquet to all his officials and ministers. 
Esther's banquet. He also granted a holiday to the provinces and gave gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were gathered together, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her kindred or her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. But in those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry, and they conspired to assassinate King Ahasuerus. But the matter came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. And when the affair was investigated and found to be so, both the men were hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Friend, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Along with reading from the book of Esther each week, we are pairing that with some verses from the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs. This is a famous chapter that focuses on women, and particularly wives, uh, but its wisdom lifts up the virtues in women. And so they provide wisdom that sometimes was not always apparent to kings like King Aserus back in the days of Esther. So here are these few verses from Proverbs 31 as we also think about Queen Esther. It says, a capable wife, who can find? She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Friends, will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, draw near to us this day. As we gather in this place, we're surrounded by your spirit. As we hear once more the story of Esther, we're reminded of the ways you come to the stories of our lives. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be a sacrifice acceptable in your sight. For you are with us this day and always, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I want to start with a short quote by Toni Morrison, which I want you to remember and which I'll come back to at the end of the sermon itself. Morrison once said, the function of freedom is to free someone else. We may think freedom is something that we possess, a right that's given to us, when in fact the purpose and the value of freedom comes when we use our freedom to free someone else, someone else who is captive or oppressed or afraid. The function of freedom is to free someone else. Now, the first banquet in the book of Esther was described in chapter 1. It was a gluttonous feast overseen by a drunken king who tried to force his wife, Queen Vashti, to parade her royal beauty for the amusement of the partygoers. Vashti refused, and in that act, lost her crown, but not her dignity and self-respect. Chapter 2 of Esther is going to also end with a banquet, but these festivities are ones to celebrate that a replacement queen has been found at last. And we once again encounter King Ahasuerus on his throne, but as I mentioned earlier, we also meet a Jewish exile who's living there in the Persian capital city, a man named Mordecai, a Jewish descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. It's noted that he lived in the citadel, which simply means in the central part of the city itself, the capital. And so because he lived there, he likely was some form of a minor government official in the court. In addition to Mordecai, then, we're also introduced to the young girl, Esther. Esther is an orphan. She's a relative of Mordecai who's been raised by him as if she were his daughter. Now, as we heard from the end of chapter 1, the king needed a new queen. Esther was fair and beautiful. So she was taken into the king's court as a possible candidate. She became part of the harem. 
She was dressed up, primped and perfumed, and eventually was chosen by Ahasuerus to be his new wife. Now, I could do an entire sermon on the flawed power dynamics that are described here, the misogyny and the abuse of women who exist somehow only in a man's royal harem. And we might wish that the behaviors of 2,500 years ago no longer existed today, but we know that there are still child marriages and honor killings that happen throughout the world. But for the sake of today's message, there's actually another detail that I want to highlight. In the verses I read, twice it said explicitly that Esther did not tell anyone about her ethnicity that she was a Jew, this core identity she kept a secret. And that secret's going to play an important role in the story, and it's a detail worth exploring. So what is a secret? Well, usually we think of secrets as something that involves a deception that we intentionally hide from others. When I was a kid, my sister and I were racing back to the house running from the bus stop to see who could be the first one to touch the back door. We were neck and neck as we crossed the patio, and when we reached the back door, we slammed into it and then shattered the storm glass panel that was on the back door. Now, being kids, we panicked. We picked up all the glass, and we carefully removed the bent frame from the door and left only the screen in place. And we never told our parents about our little race. And we actually forgot all about our misdeed until a point in late October when the weather was getting colder and suddenly we heard my dad shout, hey, what happened to the glass panel in the back door? At that point, we were busted. Now, that's an example of a secret with a relatively short shelf life. We decided to hide something from our parents. We forgot about our misdeed, but our sin came to light, and we faced the consequences and moved on. But there are other secrets that can literally last for years. Some people carry around secrets about their own past, perhaps a struggle with addiction or a criminal record. Some people carry around secrets about their very own identity, feeling afraid to tell their family and friends about their sexual orientation, or that they truly understand themselves to be non-binary or transsexual. And these are very hard secrets to keep. You have to watch everything you say. You have to be constantly vigilant. You have to do the exhausting work of self-monitoring, even in the most casual of friendly conversations. Now, psychological studies have shown that keeping secrets can actually lead to lower well-being, to worse health, and less satisfying relationships. But interesting, the psychic damage does not come so much from keeping the secret as it does from the sheer weight of constantly thinking about the secret. It's, It's tiring to have a secret that keeps coming back to mind, that keeps reoccurring internally over and over. When we tell ourselves, well, they might not like me if they really knew me, or I can't say what I really feel because if I do, my true identity will be revealed. It's exhausting. That's why being able to share a secret can literally be healing. There's a catharsis in getting this burden off of our hearts. But even more important, usually when we share a secret, we share it with someone that we trust. And hopefully, in the sharing of the secret, there's a conversation that follows. And again, hopefully, that conversation is one that is supportive, that the person offers advice as you then deal with your long-held secret. Because once someone else knows the secret, the, the weight, the psychic weight is eased. And even just that one conversation can lead to a healthier self-image and a more positive outlook. One of the recent LGBTQ campaigns has encouraged people to be open about their sexual identity using the tagline, 
it gets better. And in many ways, science has proven the truth of that remark. Now, Esther had a big secret that she was hiding within her, even as she moved further into the heart of the palace. She was a Jewish maiden. She was part of an exiled, oppressed community, despite being introduced with a Gentile name. Now, Mordecai knew her secret, and he advised her not to share it with others. But once the crown was placed on her head and the royal banquet was held in her honor, Queen Esther's banquet, the weight of that secret was especially heavy on her shoulders. Now, if you remember the whole story of Esther, you know that one of the king's advisors was a petty, jealous man named Haman who became angry later on when Mordecai refused to bow down before him and eventually creates an entire plot in which all of the Jewish citizens of the province were going to be killed through a genocide. This act will make Esther's secret even harder to bear. Now, we'll find out how Esther uses her wisdom and her cleverness to save her people. That will come about next week. But before that twist occurs in the story, one of her first acts as queen is actually to speak up for justice, is to protect her family, as Heather had mentioned. Mordecai had learned of a plot to kill the king. When he passed on this information to Esther, she wisely warned Ahasuerus and thwarted the entire assassination attempt. So rather than stay quiet, Despite her secret and the risks involved, Esther in that moment stepped into the spotlight and she did what was right, setting free someone else. Now put yourself in Esther's shoes for a moment. I mean that figuratively, I don't know what size she wore. But as you imagine her walking around the palace and the difficulties she faced, it's clear that things were not easy for her. She had already lost both her parents. She was living as a Jewish girl in a foreign land, and her beauty likely made her a target for exploitation. Even though her time in the harem had culminated with a crown being placed on her head, there's no denying the fundamental power imbalance in her life and that she was still persistently at the mercy of men. All sorts of things seem to conspire against her to put her in harm's way. Think about them. History itself, the Jews in exile, the biases of human society, a young girl pulled into a harem, the politics of courtrooms and kings, the realities of fate that suddenly put her in the spotlight. There are times when we too list off all the things that seem to be working against us when we're feeling particularly sad or depressed, claiming that history is against us and society is against us and we have bad luck or bad finances or bad bosses or there's simply pervasive injustice and racism that is coming towards us based on our gender and ethnic identity. When things aren't going well, when relationships fail, when our health turns sour, when life is hard, we do often take time to list off all that's working against us. And when we list that off, that can pull us back from the world and into ourselves. That can prompt us to put our heads down and keep our mouths shut so that things don't get worse, so that our shortcomings and our secrets are not revealed. Esther could very well have chosen that path. She could have said, thank you for the crown, but may I be excused? I really have nothing to say. I have nothing to offer. I just want to be left alone. And yes, it's true that in our own lives, there are things that work against us. Politics, injustice, bad luck. I don't deny that. But those are not the only things that are active in the world. By faith, we believe that there are other things. And by faith, we proclaim them to be wonderful things, life-giving things, working upon us and around us by a loving God and a saving Christ. Things like persistent grace, 
compassion, sacrificial love, patience, endurance, hope. If other things conspire against us, there is an even greater power that is working to sustain us, to lift us up, to help us keep on keeping on. And all of this is the Lord's doing. All of this is designed to encourage us to hold on, to hold our heads up, to care about what's happening around us, and to speak up and do what's right. It calls us not to simply be Hadassah, the young maiden thrust into palace politics, hoping to keep her head down and her secrets safe, but to choose to be Queen Esther, the woman who walks confidently in the hallways of royalty, the woman who looks the world in the eye, who speaks up for what is just and what is fair, and who literally saves her husband's life by breaking the silence. Now recall the words of Toni Morrison again. The function of freedom is to free someone else. You are each free. You and I each may still have struggles. We may each still carry secrets. We may be unsure about tomorrow. But as children of God, you are free. As a child of God, you know there are great things all around you that are working every day to sustain you, to protect you, to strengthen you, to keep you safe. In Christ, your full identity is known. Your sins are forgiven. Your potential is celebrated. And so you are called beloved. And as it says in Romans 8, no power, no ruler, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So use that freedom to free someone else, even as you yourself are free. Share that good news with others. Welcome others in. Help others know that, yes, it does get better. Help others know that Though tears and sadness may last for a day, it is joy that comes in the morning. Help others to know that they, like you, like Queen Esther, like the Church Universal, is sustained by the good news that tells us in life and in death we belong to God and therefore we will not be afraid. Thanks be to God. Amen.